Welcome to the first session of Bursting Wineskins. I'm Gary Peluso Verden, Executive Director of the Center for Religion and Public Life at Phillips Theological Seminary. And the title of this first of our six episodes is The End of the Christian American Myth. The American myth in sum is America is a nation of immigrants drawn to these shores for religious freedom and the opportunity to create a new society. God has chosen this nation for special work in the world and for special blessings for those blessed enough to live here. Although we've had our issues with race and with Indian peoples, those are largely in the past. America is the greatest nation and the greatest democracy the world has ever seen. We are a shining city on a hill, except when the wrong people are in power. America is a land of opportunity and freedom. It might have been a nation of small farms and villages, as Thomas Jefferson wanted, but Hamilton and Madison won out. It is a large commercial nation where the freedom to engage in business, to better yourself and your family, is of high and maybe the highest importance. It is a nation of freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to think what you please. It is meant to be a nation of minimal and local government, an arrangement that both requires and maximizes the need for personal responsibility. You should enjoy the just fruits of your labor. The rich should be allowed to grow richer, the middle class should flourish, and the poor can pull themselves up through hard work. Everyone deserves a fair chance to succeed. The markets set the meritocracy that should determine the winners and losers. Any inequality that develops is due to the working out of markets over long periods of time. We are a nation of laws to which everyone is subject. Now here is the conclusion of Ronald Reagan's farewell speech in 1989. Reagan retrieved an almost forgotten message delivered by Massachusetts Bay Colony leader John Winthrop. In lifting up Winthrop's image of a city on a hill, Reagan moved that image from Winthrop's context, grabbed it out of history, and cast it into the realm of myth. This is what he said. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we would call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and see it still. And how stands the city on this winter night? More prosperous, more secure, and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the granite ridge, and her glow is held steady no matter what storm. And she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward home. We've done our part, and as I walk off into the city streets, a final word to the men and women of the Reagan Revolution, the men and women across America who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city freer. And we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. And so, goodbye, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. President Reagan gave an excellent speech, but as far as an accurate usage of an historical reference, not so much. Freedom, in fact, is not in any wise the theme of John Winthrop's sermon. Mutual responsibilities is. And Winthrop was very careful to say the colony would be as a city on a hill, 
as an extremely important word to that Bible-soaked Puritan, not Pilgrim, who knew better than to appropriate ancient Israel and substitute the Massachusetts colony. If one reads the story of this sermon in its historical context, one learns that the message was nearly forgotten, indeed it was seldom mentioned and not assigned any real importance until the middle of the 20th century. Think of the sermon's rediscovery as unearthing a weapon for the Cold War. Winthrop's target audience was not, of course, future readers. He had something much more immediate in mind, the funding of the colony by its backers in England. In particular, Winthrop emphasized the duties of the rich to the poor and the curse that would follow failure to observe their duties to each other. He wanted to ensure the rich kept funding the colonists and underline the dire consequences of being as a city on a hill if the colony failed. So here's part of the sermon known as a model of Christian charity. Listen to Winthrop's words. God Almighty in his most holy and wise providence hath so disposed of the condition of mankind as in all times, some must be rich, some poor. Some high and eminent in power and dignity, others mean and in subjection. That every man might have need of others, and from hence they might all be knit more nearly together in the bonds of brotherly affection. From hence it appears plainly, no man is made more honorable than another, or more wealthy, etc., out of any particular and single respect to himself, but for the glory of his Creator, and the common good of the creature, man. Therefore, God still reserves the property of these gifts to himself. He calls, he there calls wealth in Ezekiel, his gold and his silver in Proverbs. He claims their service as his due. Honor the Lord with thy riches. All men being thus by divine providence ranked into two sorts, rich and poor. Under the first are comprehended all such as are able to live comfortably by their own means duly improved, and all others are poor according to the former distribution. Now the only way to avoid shipwreck in this new land and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man, we must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must hold, uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work as members of the same body. So shall we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as his own people and will command us a blessing upon all our ways so that we shall see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than formerly we had been acquainted with. We shall find the God of Israel is among us when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, may the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God and all the professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going. Historians interpret this message, whether it is a sermon or not, whether it was actually spoken aboard the Arabella before disembarking or not, as a plea for the rich to help the poor, and for the poor to remember their duties to the rich, a social hierarchy assigned to them by God. But the contrast between Winthrop's meaning and Reagan's usage provides a powerful example of rendering history into myth. 
This course is an argument for why America needs a new myth. Before I tell you what I think America needs, uh, why I think America needs a new myth, I should explain what I mean by myth. As school children, we probably heard someone say, ah, that's just a myth, by which they mean something fictional, untrue, and therefore something that should be dismissed. But myths, while sometimes fictional, are often both powerful and dismissible only at our peril. In fact, myths can be more durable than facts. The myth of human dominance over creation and everything on Earth is meant for our species, battles with the science of climate change. The myth of Christian America is contradicted time and again in the historical record, if by Christian we mean anything like Jesus' teachings about loving God and loving neighbors as ourselves. A version of practiced Christianity in the U.S. was on display in battle garb on January 6th of this year. The myth of the lost cause, that the cause of the Civil War was states' rights, and that God used the war to purify the South, which would rise again and win the next battle, is demonstrably false. Slavery, its preservation and expansion in the West, was the cause. The lost cause persists in Christian circles. Another example of the power of myth is how we imagine Jesus' birth. Biblical scholars for nearly 300 years have underlined the fundamental differences between the birth narratives in Matthew and in Luke, but every year, Christians in Song and Nativity displays play out the mythic mashup of both stories, plus everything the stories leave out. I mean, that what's the number of magi we don't know, and which animals were at the stable, no one says. A myth is a deep story that taps a source of meaning that a people believes to be profoundly true, a bedrock truth, a truth about the meaning of life, about the meaning of a people's origin, about the meaning of one's purpose in life. A myth may incorporate historical facts, but the facts serve the myth. One might say that myths absorb facts and alters the facts to serve the myth. It is really, really hard to change a people's myth. For a myth captures imaginations, hearts, and emotions. Yet America's myth is changing even as I write. The old mythic wineskins are bursting. What is it that connects Black Lives Matter, taking a knee before a football game during the playing the national anthem, the attempted insurrection in Washington on January 6th, as well as the plot against Michigan Governor Whitmer, anti-fascist violence in Portland, opposition to and support for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and public education debates regarding how race and racism are addressed in high school curricula. Also, there are probably thousands of works in American history that address facts and stories intentionally omitted from high school standard textbooks because the facts and stories undermine our myth. The connection to all this Old wineskins are bursting. The myth of American exceptionalism and chosenness is being assailed. Here are a few examples of what I mean. The standard American story begins with the European encounters with Indian peoples on the east coast of North America, especially Virginia, Massachusetts, and the Carolinas, and then expanding westward. I call this the Puritan radiation theory. This story depicts the origins of the U.S. in religious freedom-motivated peoples who believe they were chosen by God to establish a better, more Christian, ecclesiastical, and civil governments and cultures than existed anywhere in the world since the days of the early church. But just as modern archaeology has presented evidence of the first peoples in the Americas coming during multiple pe periods by multiple means from Chile to Alaska by foot and by boat, so what became the United States started from multiple points. Multiple cultures, multiple nations, multiple origin myths. Let's take a look at three maps now. This first map shows how deficient that one-point origin story is. Colin Woodard wrote a book entitled American Nations. In our discussion this upcoming Thursday, we might talk a bit about this map, but in short, the map indicates settler colonists from and influenced by Spain, France, the Netherlands, England, and Russia, all interacting with various indigenous nations. 
Furthermore, the map shows the boundaries of 11 different cultures that still influence what politics, civic life, and religion mean within those boundaries. Another map is this one published in 1940 by the Council Against Intolerance in America, including doodles by the famous poet Langston Hughes. Look at all the different cultures and languages and artists that various nations have bequeathed this nation. Other myths straining at their wineskins include the first Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving celebrations were one side of the seesaw between feast and fast days during the Civil War. Fast when there was a defeat, feast and Thanksgiving for a victory. Our modern version of Thanksgiving is more of an entry into commercial Christmas season than it is anything else. No real ties back to the Plymouth Colony and their relationship with the Wampanoag Indians who helped them and with whom they allied briefly against Wampanoag enemies. The settlers and colonists did not encounter wilderness, but lands inhabited by maybe 12 million or so people, most of whom were not hunter-gatherers, but actually farmed cultivated lands. This map that's up now is from the U.S. Department of the Interior showing early, early Indian tribes, cultural areas, and linguistic stocks. Look at how crowded that map is. Another part of the myth, settlers were virtuous, hardworking, and religious, and tried to make a living in the midst of hardships and savage beasts. Courage and determination many settlers indeed had. Virtuosity? The reports say not so much. How much does the phrase, making the world safe for democracy, really make sense of the wars in which America has engaged versus making the world safe for American markets in the extraction and movement of oil? How old is American democracy? Do we claim its origin in New England town halls, uh, perhaps in the Iroquois Confederacy, in the Constitution, or was it in 1965 with the Voting and Civil Rights Acts? We are a republic rather than a democracy, some say. They point to that we have a uh, popular election of senators just happened starting from 1913 on. We have the Electoral College. Originally, just white property males were able to vote. The Constitution recognized and empowered states to set voting requirements. Then, black and white males in 1870 were able to vote, but not women of either or all Indians. Women were granted the right to vote in 1920, Indians 1924. Then the Voting and Civil Rights Acts in 64 and 65 to rectify illegal state-imposed voting restrictions came. In response has been gerrymandering, new rounds of voting restrictions, attempts to use original measures to restrict voting to those who will produce the desired outcome. Democracy without the 15th, 17th, 19th, and 26th Amendments look very different from the way democracy should look today. How old is our democracy? Maybe not that old. How structurally rooted is racism in America? Was there an original paradise from which the nation fell? Was racism limited at first to the middle and southern colonies? Or was the nation, in Ibram Kendi's words, stamped from the beginning? I think the evidence that Kendi is right is overwhelming. These are just a few of the matters historians and allied interest groups are pressing to the national attention, and these debates are bursting the national myth. With the end of a national myth comes tremendous anxiety and fear and the real potential for peril. Yale historian Greg Grandin quotes poet Anne Carson at the outset of his book on the end of the myth. To live past the end of your myth is a perilous thing. We see the peril associated with the crumbling myth. Aggressive Christian nationalism versus secular, multicultural, and multicolored America. Open white supremacy. Old bigotries finding new life. Demonstrators chanting, Jews shall not replace us eroding the value of democracy where everyone gets a vote and everyone's vote counts equally. Fears around immigration. 
Freedom emotionally presented as an absolute value rather than a right exists in relationship to and limited by others' rights and others' rights. Critical race theory and the legitimacy of the historical and moral claims made in public spaces. Reparations, uh, questions such as the continuity of institutions like cities and states, like here in Tulsa and in Oklahoma. The claims of one generation and another and responsibilities, individual equality versus social equity. Tribal national sovereignty, uh, reclaiming Indian life from legal and cultural genocide. Uh, religious exemptions from those who fear the moral order in which they want to do their business. Mask and vaccine mandates as assaults on personal freedom or protection of public spaces. And the big lie and insurrection are patriots trying to wrest their country from the jaws of hell. All these things are, anxi are examples of the anxieties we're seeing. Now that said, we Christians have our fingerprints all over America's myth to the present day, some for good, some for ill. All the European colonizing nations were officially Christian. Nearly all of them included a Christ and King theme in their founding colonies, as evidenced by the close alliance between religious orders and colonization, including competing Protestant churches. A major current running throughout American history is exceptionalism. In religious terms, the word is chosen. The claim to be chosen by God liberally draws on the story and symbols of biblical Israel. The core narrative arc is from Exodus to the Promised Land. Liberation from Egypt first became a cry from pubs and pulpits for revolution against the British Pharaoh. After the Exodus from Britain, the land-hungry interests, including speculators, traders, and settlers, turned their eyes west. They claimed they were going into a wilderness, which many also considered their promised land, their Canaan. We know they were invading someone else's homelands and taking the lands for themselves, battling, conquering, converting, or purifying the land of native nations was America's conquest of their holy land. The conquerors were largely from and or descended from the nations of Europe, persons who were eventually melded together and described as white. They were the ones served by the themes of Exodus and conquest of Canaan, a story that by the middle of the 19th century morphed into manifest destiny. God has saved the land from the Atlantic to the Pacific for white Americans moving from east to the west. White Christians were meant to conquer and cultivate, civilize and spiritualize the land. Whiteness and possessing the wealth of land is not incidental to the American Christian myth. It is essential to it. But one would apply the Exodus narrative quite differently if you were a native nation and found yourself cast as Canaanites. Not your myth, not your destiny. Or if you were stolen from an African nation, brought here in an inhuman slaving ship, and enslaved for life. For these people, as they learn the Bible, it is no surprise that they understood this nation to be Egypt from which they prayed, hoped, worked, and sometimes revolted to accomplish their own exodus. In addition to utilizing the Exodus saga to shape America's self-understanding as an exceptional nation, Christians also have our fingerprints all over fundamental institutions and moral codes. A favorite exercise of mine is to imagine something like religion as metal filings scattered throughout the landscape. Now take a, a magnet powerful enough to attract all those filings. What would the following sectors and cultural realms of this nation look like if we extracted the Christian religion from all of it? Well, higher education. From Harvard, the University of Southern California, religions has founded many hundreds of colleges. Sexuality and gender. Imagine any debate about abortion, the gender roles of women or men, considering, uh, considering non-binary persons, how we think about and treat LGBTQ persons, without considering Christian perspectives what family means and how families are supported or not by religious communities and through public policy. Work and money. Extract out all language related to calling, much philanthropic giving, and whatever is left of the Protestant work ethic of work hard, save, make progress, and give. Race and color. 
As I mentioned above, white Christians were at the forefront of justifying slavery, creating a category of whiteness, and constructing a society in which skin color matters greatly. Works by Ivram Kendi, Edward Bloom, Althea Butler, and Robert P. Jones amply demonstrate these fingerprints. Righteous violence. Authorization to kill is often morally grounded. Self-defense, stand your ground, just war, capital punishment. The so-called myth of redemptive violence evidenced in so many American films is often grounded in a religious ethic of an eye for an eye, or that the spilling of blood requires the spilling of blood in order for justice to be done and a social tear repaired. Health and healing. Religions and religious orders have long understood bodily health to be related to spiritual health and physical infirmity to provide occasion for life-transforming spiritual care. In this three-frame review of the long movie about Christianity and American culture, we see some good to celebrate and some horrible consequences from which we need to repent and seek to repair. In particular, the possibility of the nation incarnating the dream of white Christian nationalist true believers is stronger than at any time since the Civil War, or at least since the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act were passed in 64 and 65. Therefore, those of us who see white Christian nationalism as both heresy in Christianity and as destroyer of America's promise should do our level best to understand the old narrative, cut the power lines that feed the destructive narrative, recover elements that might be useful moving forward, and reimagine the nation. So finally for this week, where are we headed in this class? Each week we'll include a lecture and links to primary and secondary source documents I'll be using within that lecture. You have the opportunity to explore as much or as little of those documents as interest you. I've limited documents to ones you can access on the web. For October 11th, during that week, we'll look at how to pay attention to the matrix of religion and politics. The American experiment of separating church and state also depends on how the relationship between religion and politics is interpreted. Religion and political agendas play together, for better and for worse, in the cultural construction of stories, ideas, and practices of belonging and exclusion, moral hierarchies, and solving problems. During the week of October 18th, we'll look at the conflicting energies that result in uh, narratives of conquest and narratives of friendship. There's a long tradition in colonial history and Christianity that nothing, individuals, peoples, lands, is useful to God until it is conquered and cultivated. In the U.S., this theological disposition is aligned with conversion-oriented Christianity, technological domination of the land, and the conquest of indigenous persons. But there are other spiritual and theological traditions of meeting, befriending, hospitality, and stewardship. For the week of November 1st, and the conflicting energies we'll talk about will be those that have both sought to preserve as well as to challenge hierarchy. Religion can be conservative or it can be revolutionary. In American history, expressions of Christianity have backed white colorism with white at the pure end of the scale, male over female, capital over labor, conquer over conquered, heteronormativity over all others. And some expressions of Christianity have championed ecclesial and social revolutions against these hierarchies. During the week of November 8th, we'll look at the conflicting energies between uh, righteous violence and trying to repair brokenness in society. There is a strong affinity in American culture between socially conservative Christianity, support for using military force, and punishing wrongdoing. Christians have also argued for the public value of peace, restorative justice, confession, repentance, penance, atonement, forgiveness, and reconciliation. And finally, in the last week, we're going to be bold enough to look at what might lead toward a better myth. What might religions in general, and Christianity specifically, contribute toward a more perfect union, dedicated to the proposition of equality that has not yet been fulfilled. 
Can biblical teachings regarding measuring justice by how a society treats the poor be invoked without also opening the gates to everything that accompanies being chosen nation, conquest, exercised dominion, and as you'll find out, and some on the right identifying international organizations such as the United Nations, the World Council of Churches, as building towers of Babel uh, and uh, associated with the Antichrist. If there's going to be a United States in the future, someone or someones from somewhere is going to propose a myth of origins and destiny that will resonate with and move people to act. Might as well give it a try. If you have questions for Thursday night's discussion, please email them to me before Thursday night. Depending on the question or comment, I may respond by email, chat with you, uh, and I'd perhaps use the question during the Thursday night discussion. Don't be shy. I'll send the Zoom link for the discussion on either Wednesday or Thursday. I hope to see you Thursday night.